God, we thank you for providing us a space and time where we can set aside the hustle and bustle of the world and just focus on what it is that you would have for us today. I pray, Father, today that it be your words and that, Father, that maybe, Lord, that it'll bring some healing and reconciliation to relationships that have been broken and that you are a God who restores us, who reclaims us, who revives us and then releases us. So we pray, God, that as we leave this place, that we are changed and transformed than that which we've walked in here. And Lord, I pray that you would forgive me of my sins, that it not become a hindrance to your word, and that at the end of the day, we would in return give you the honor and glory that you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen. For those of you who have been with us the past couple of weeks, we've been going through a sermon series called Live to Bless Others. And today I'm just going to kind of take a detour because I had a spiritual pulse um, that we need to move away a little bit from the aspect of ministry and, and refocus our attention on relationships. I remember last week when I preached, I shared this quote with you, something that my grandmother lived by. She would say that the quality of life is based on the quality of relationships. The quality of your life is based on the quality of relationships. Well, pastor, what if my relationships are broken? Pastor, what if I'm, 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 I'm in a current relationship that, that, that isn't functioning the way that, that I thought it should be? Then is that considered to be uh, the way that God has intended it to be? And my answer to that is this. A lot of times we are in broken relationships because we have never been taught on how to deal with conflict. Some of us might have grown up into an environment that just conflict was, was something that we, that we ignored or something that we ran from. But I want to share with you today that conflict is actually something that we should neither ignore or we should run from. That conflict is something that God allows us to let grace triumph. And if we don't allow conflict and head on into it straightforward, we're not allowing God's spirit and the grace of God to triumph within our relationships. If I'm going to be honest here, I will share with you that, that as I started pastoral ministry, that I was a very passive aggressive. I, I, I was afraid that, that by, by my leadership that I would offend other people by what I would say or how I would dictate uh, the way that they should Go, the things that they should do, the things that the Lord has taught me or shared with me on behalf of, of what they might need to grow. And, and if I'm, if I'm going to be honest, I, I, I bet you that probably 80%, if not 90%, of everybody sitting in this chair is passive aggressive. Because there's two types of people. There's people who are passive aggressive, and then there's people who are passionately aggressive. Right, and let me share that it's a passive aggressive are those that just run from conflict. They don't like conflict, right? And then the other is passionately aggressive, right? These are the people that say, well, well, pastor, I like to keep it real. <laughs> pastor, I, I'm the type of person that likes to keep it 100. And then my response to that is, yeah, you're a jerk. <laughs> really? Because oftentimes it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And a lot of passionate, aggressive people, even though they mean well, just don't know how to say it in terms or in a way that it's healthy for the relationship. So today, family, I should charge you, but I give it to you for free. But if you want to make a note and add it to the Oshkosh Fund, please, if you feel the Lord leading you in that direction, Please do. Give, give to our Pathfinders, would you say amen? So family today, reconciliation acknowledges the fact that there has been a separation between two or more parties, just as God has declared that our sins have separated us from him, which is found in Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, if you want to proof text it. So family, you got to understand that sin is at the core of this disunity or this discord between us and God, and actually, it's the very thing that divides us and other relationships. So I gave you an acronym a few uh, sermons ago about sin. Sin, the acronym for sin is this. Sin, the S for number one is sin, it separates us. It separates us. The book of Genesis talks about how God put enmity, 
right? He, that word enmity is there's a separation. When we sin, it separates us. Although you got to understand that nothing can separate us from the love of God. We have separated ourselves from God. We, have, we were born into this world with a bent towards sin. So sin separates us. The other thing that sin does, it isolates us. How do I know? It's because every time my kids do something wrong and their mom gives them those words that no kid wants to hear, wait till your dad gets home. What do they do? But they, they, they hear the car or the garage rolling up and, and we go and we run and we hide. We isolate ourselves from the situation, again, because we fear conflict. The other thing that happens with sin is this. If you do it enough times, you become numb to the sin. That where you start to justify the very thing that is wrong because you've done it so, so many times, it's been so repetitive in your life that we don't know the difference between what is right and what is wrong. So can I, can I share with you that in a relationship, the same thing happens. When we are in disunity with individuals, when there is conflict in a relationship, the first thing we do, we separate ourselves. We don't want to deal with it. And then for some of us, we'll isolate ourselves. We, we, we go into our little corner or, or we isolate ourselves and put ourselves in a position, right, to, to go to these unhealthy habits to feed this desire that needs to be reconciled. But instead, we run to chocolate. Got quiet. Run to Starbucks. Let's, let's get deeper. Run to pornography. Run, run, run to any addiction, alcohol, substance abuse. Work can be an addiction. Work can be an escape. And sometimes we would rather be at work instead of dealing with the conflict at home. God teaches us how it is that we can live in a healthy relationship, not only with God, but also with each other. Because of the sin relationship, God has been tainted, and maybe I can say alienated to a point where people today don't know the difference between an authentic relationship and a fabricated relationship. If you go through the Beatitudes, which we'll spend a lot of our time in today, in Matthew chapter 5, you got to understand that the Beatitudes addresses this issue between religion and relationship. Beatitudes gives us an idea of the religious way to take care of things, and the relational way in approaching conflict. So family, today I'm just going to give you a few points on how it is that we can deal with conflict. The first point is this. Recognize your altitude to realize your attitude. Let me say that again. Recognize your altitude to realize your attitude. So watch this now. Your altitude affects your attitude, Lord have mercy. Your perception, huh, right, actually drives your direction. Meaning this, our altitude uh, can, can, can equal to that sense of our pride. Because a lot of us, right, in order for us to really understand the conflict that is going on between us and other people, is it has based on everything that you see and perceive yourself to be in the relationship. Sometimes we try to blame the other person, but in reality, God is calling us to look at ourselves for us to recognize our altitude so that we can realize our attitude. Amen. Your altitude is equivalent to your pride, and the Bible suggests that your altitude or your pride or your neglect to resolve conflict in your life becomes a barrier of three things. I want you to be very, very mindful of the three things that you, if you don't deal with conflict, these are the three things Right, that the Bible suggests will happen. Right, so the first thing that happens to this, if you don't seek reconciliation with others, it would also block your fellowship with God. If you do not seek reconciliation with others, it will block your fellowship with God. 1 John 4, 20 says this. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a what? Is a liar. Then it goes on to say, for whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Can I tell you something that you cannot be right with God and be wrong with your brother or your sister? Right? It's like this. Like I, one of, one of the, the subjects that I really hated in school was math. Right? I'm terrible at math. And, and half the times I don't, 
I don't blame myself. I blame the teacher. Amen. Because there are some times, and it's young people who are here today, you could probably relate. Some of us have teachers and professors that love the subject more than they love the student. Amen. Like I had a math teacher that loved math so much that he spent most of his time facing the board, looking at numbers, drawing up numbers, and less time facing the students. And oftentimes I would tell my other classmates, I'm like, does he even know that we're in the room? Because he's having a love relationship with these numbers on the wall, yet there's like, there's like 30 of us in here, and he's not getting the point. Some of us cannot be right with God and wrong with other people. Because some of us love God more than we love people. And that's an oxymoron. Some of us, how, can it, how is it can be that we can love God and not love people? The other... The other month, about about a year ago, the conference got together, all the pastors throughout Southeastern California Conference, and they gave us a survey, right? And they gave us a survey, and the survey was to, to address where the, 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 the strong points in our ministry in the Southeastern California Conference is, and what areas do we lack in? Where, where are the areas that we, that we need help in? So they, they did this, right, to every pastor, every church, In the Southeastern California Conference, they did the survey. They ran the numbers. We had a workers' meeting. We all met, and they gave us the numbers. They put it on this big screen with a PowerPoint. And the first thing that came up, and says, you know what we're really good at? We were really good at sharing the word. The numbers don't lie. We were good at sharing the word. Now watch this now. Everybody in the room started feeling good about ourselves. We started patting ourselves on the back. Oh, good. We're, we're evangelizing. We're doing really good. We're, we're sharing the gospel. But then they came to the point where we were the weakest at. And you know where we were the weakest at? Loving our neighbor. How is it that we are so good at sharing the word, yet we're so bad at loving our neighbor. There is a discrepancy in, that, in, the, in the numbers there because isn't loving my neighbors sharing the word? It could be a hindrance in a block with our fellowship with God when we're at discord with other people. The other thing that happens about unsolved conflict does this. Unsolved conflicts ruins your life. Ruins your, it's toxic. Oftentimes we think that that avoiding conflict will make us better, but it makes us bitter. And if we don't address conflict, it doesn't make you, it doesn't make the situation better. The longer you make, the longer it festers, the longer it starts to grow, and the more you become bitter. Ephesians 4, 31 32 says this, it says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. Then it says this, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as who? As God in Christ has forgiven you. Have you ever met somebody that was just so angry at somebody else? And, you know, here's the problem. Half the time that you're upset with somebody, they have no idea that you have an issue with them. And you're spending all this time upset and angry and and avoiding conflict that that you yourself, right? It's like this. It's like me drinking the poison and hoping somebody else would die. It's this idea that that if we avoid conflict and we ignore it, it, it doesn't make you better. It makes you bitter. And you know what that does? Have you ever left fruit in the house too long? You know what I just found out just the other week? That if you leave rice in the bag open for too long, that sometimes they don't really wash the rice out really good. And then all these pesticides will start to fester. And the longer you leave it without it, without tending to it, that all these little insects will come out of the bag into the pantry. And then not only in the pantry, but will seep under the door and get into the kitchen. And then also into the living room and also into the bedroom and possibly in the bathroom. And then you will wake up one day and you'll realize this whole time since you have intended to this rice that everything else in the house is infested. 
Some of us are holding on to baggage and unresolved conflict that we don't even realize is infesting our homes and infesting our children and infesting our community. And then we have the audacity to bring it to the church. If you don't say amen, you better say, ouch. But God gives us God gives us tools in how we can resolve this conflict. If you don't resolve conflict, not only does it hinder your relationship and your fellowship with God, but it makes your life toxic. The other thing that happens when you don't resolve conflict, right, uh, if your attitude is too high uh, in your life, it blocks your prayers. Did you realize that it blocks your prayers? Can I even share this with you? This just came to mind because in, in the Beatitudes, in Matthew chapter 5, I believe if you go to chapter 20, verse 22, 23, and 24, it, it actually says this, right? It tells us if we don't resolve conflict that, that God prioritizes that before our offering. He prioritizes. He says if you come to the church with your offering, and then it says this, and your brother has an issue with you. It doesn't even say that if you have an issue with somebody else. It says if your brother has an issue of you, it is your responsibility. But watch what it says. It says leave your offering and go reconcile with your brother. And then after you're done, it says to come back. God prioritizes the relationship far more than your offering because what good is you giving an offering if your heart isn't in the right place? It hinders your prayer. The Bible tells us this, 1 Peter 3, 7. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. Wives, say amen. And treat them with respect as the weaker partner, as the heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your what? Your prayers. Unresolved conflict. The next thing that happens is this. If you don't resolve conflict, it blocks your happiness. It blocks your happiness. Proverbs 17, 22 says that a cheerful heart is a good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the what? Dries up the bones. Family, once you've re recognized your altitude to realize your attitude, you can get into some pretty practical forms of reconciliation. The best way to start this recon reconciliation process is this. Point number two, lower your altitude to lift your what? Your attitude. Lower your altitude to lift your attitude. James 4.10 tells us this. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will what? He will exalt you. Can I share this family? Let's go practical now, okay? Let's go practical. Humility is often the fuel that breeds reconciliation. And the Bible suggests that in order for you to deal with conflict, the first thing you need to do is pray. Right? And I put them all in peace for you so we can all remember. Amen. So the first thing you do is pray. What do I pray about, Pastor? Well, pray for yourself. And then pray for the person. Because oftentimes we go into prayer and we're constantly praying that God will change the other person's heart when God in the whole time is trying to change your heart. And then sometimes we pray this prayer, Lord, man, I'm, in this, I'm at this job and God, it's, not, it's ungodly and I don't know, Lord, why I'm here. Please, can you provide another job for me to go to? So, Lord, Lord I can be in a better environment. And God's like, that's why I put you there. For you to change the environment. And so many times we pray for the other person when God is trying to have you pray and grow yourself. Pray, talk to God before you talk to the person. James 4, 1 and 2 says this, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't let them come from your desires, that battle where? Within you. Can I tell you that you are the biggest problem? In conflict, guess what? I'm the biggest problem. I've come to realize that every time I'm in an argument with my wife, guess what? 99.9% .9 of the time, it's my fault. Honey, if you're out there and you're listening, add another point to my brownie list. <laughs> and you know, I found something very unique. Oftentimes, God's voice sounds exactly like my wife's voice. It's weird. It's weird. But family, let me tell you something. The first thing it is for us is to pray. And it says this, right? You desire but not to have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not ask. 
God. Ask God for the time and place. Ask God, God, where is the time and place that I can go, right? Because it's all about timing. Sometimes, like, men, if you're trying to work things out with your wife, uh, going to sleep right before you go to bed probably isn't the best time to have a conversation, right? Take her out uh, uh, for some danishes or something, a salad. Yeah, it goes to show how much I know about women, right? I'm just kind of throwing stuff out there. Help me out here, man. Help me out here. Take, take them somewhere in a place, in an environment that is neutral for the conversation to be open and that, 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 that they, would, they, would, they would receive it with understanding. But you have to saturate the, the conflict point in prayer and then address it. Would you say amen? amen. Pray for wisdom. And, and here's another thing, men and women, pray for, here's the word, tact. Pray for tact, because oftentimes it's not what you say, it's how you say it. All right, can I tell you, too, for, for men and women that are here, that women speak a totally different language than men do. Amen. And men, we speak a totally different language than women do. So women are very emotional beings. They, like when you talk to a woman, you have to appeal to her feelings. Amen. Right? Because they're emotional beings. So that's why the Bible says, women respect your Husbands, husband, love your wives. Can I tell you that love and respect can be interchangeable? It's just because respecting your husband is loving your husband. Loving your wife is respecting your wife. And God calls us to do this, right? Because he wants us to speak each other's language. And the problem is, is that half the time we are not bilingual when we're dealing with each other's differences. So when, when you appeal to a woman, you have to, you, like, like I said, Danishes or whatever. Help me out here, man. You take them somewhere where they, you know... Right, something. I, that, Danish is the only thing that comes to mind. I'm sorry. <laughs> Women, if, if, like, this would work out really good. Like, if you want to talk to your husband, communicate to him, PowerPoint. <laughs> PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> amen, men, you got to get an amen. Because there is clarity. There is clarity in a PowerPoint. We don't, half the time, we don't even understand what you're saying. Because it's so filled with emotions and feelings. But when you talk to us, if you were to use a PowerPoint, it says, honey, point number one, please take out the trash. <laughs> that's, that's just an example. It's specific, it's direct, but it's not like when you come in and you're like, look at this place. And like we're supposed to guess like, because like, us, we're like, well, this is normal. This is... I mean, what's wrong? What's wrong with it, right? PowerPoint. We're, we're, we speak two different languages when we address conflict. Here's the word with understanding, right? And humility. That's where reconciliation starts to thrive and starts to flourish. Would you say amen? The second step is not only to pray, but to propose. And when I say propose, can I tell you that God requires of us to make the first move. God requires of you, the one that has a conflict, even if the other person is the offender and you're the victim. Why? Because it's more healthier for you than it is for them. Because you need to address, you need to propose and make the first initial contact when it comes to reconciliation. Matthew 18, 15 to 17 says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him. And it says, do this alone. Do this alone. So God requires you to pray over it. And then he asks you to initiate, to follow through with it with understanding. And now, now here's the issue. A lot of us, we don't go there alone. <laughs> we try to bring it to the board first. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Pastor, I have an issue with the sister so-and-so. Did you pull them aside and talk to them first? No, Pastor, but I thought it'd be good that we would share this here at the board so that everybody else knows that it is her fault. She got a problem. She got issue. She needs Jesus. <laughs> the Bible tells us that we should go alone. And if you notice in the scriptures here in Matthew, it says, moreover, if your brother sins against you, that means you, the victim, should address the issue first. 
And it says go alone. And then it says if that doesn't work, then grab the entire church. If he hears you, you have gained a brother. But if not, take with you one or two more. Can I tell you, if we, if we just practice this simple biblical principle, right, nine times out of ten, it never gets past the one and two. But, but we, 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 we try to take shortcuts in going directly to let's pull in the pastor and the elders and they can resolve it. No, you try to resolve it, bring in one or two other people to resolve this. this is this practical? Right, this, this, is, this is what the Bible is sharing with us on how we can resolve conflict. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Family, if you wait and fester this passive aggressive, these things do not get better. I always, I always found it interesting on how we oftentimes run from conflict. And, when you, and I heard a preacher saying this. He's like, in a marriage, there's two types of animals. There's a skunk and there's a turtle. Right? The skunk is whenever an individual gets mad, they stink up the whole place. Right? And the other thing, the turtle in the relationship is like whenever conflict happens, they, they pull back into their shell. The other issue is that skunks always marry turtles. And there's always conflict. But I want you to understand that the high point of God's people are in its time when they are moving towards conflict instead of fleeing from it. The reason why it's hard to make the first move is not only pride, but fear. When you look in Genesis and Adam and Eve, when they ate of the fruit, Jesus was, God was walking through the garden and he was asking where they were. They ran and they hid. God asked him, why is it that you're hiding? He says, because I'm, we were, we were naked and we were ashamed. Conflict is the same way. We run and hide because we are afraid of, here's the word, vulnerability. For men to like to use that word, the V word, vulnerable, like it, in, our, in, in our world, it, 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 it projects as, as if we are weak. But can I tell you that the, some of the most vulnerable men are the most strongest men that I've known in this journey. People are afraid that they, men who know their identity that is in Christ, that are, that are transparent, that are real in a way, right, that gives honor to God. All right, vulnerability. We have to confront conflict to also provide opportunities of grace. The other P is this real quick as we bring this to an end. Is that after prayer and after propose, then it's time, here's the word, to probe. It's time to examine yourself. Every time that you deal with a conflict, Look, in the, look, look at why there was an issue and try to find the areas that you probably could grow from it. Start the conversation not with, guess what, man, you know what, you really, you really upset me with the way that you said this, that, or another. The other day when I saw you, and, you know, and half of the arguments that we have with people are what we call misunderstandings. And we come to find out that we've blown this way out of proportion that caused conflict between us, not even realize that we don't even remember half the times what the thing we were mad about. But when you probe, when, when you're able to examine yourself, like Matthew 7, 5 says, Jesus said, first get rid of the log from your own eye, then perhaps you were able to see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Let me tell you something, whether the victim or the offender, look at yourself first and find the areas that are at fault. Now, I want to make a disclaimer here. When, when I'm talking about conflict, and, and, and um, trying to find resolution to conflicts and making things right, I'm not talking about abuse. This is different. I'm talking about disagreements and quarrels. Some of you that have been abused, this is a whole nother sermon. But I'm not, I'm not talking for you to go and make, make it right with your abuser through this. There's other biblical practices that, that can take you, but this is not, that's not what I'm talking about. I want to be sensitive to the idea that some of you might be sitting here and go, how can I ever forgive so-and-so? I'm not talking about that. We're, we're just, we're just, we're keeping it at a argument or a, a, a difference between individuals. That's a whole nother sermon for a whole nother time. 
So the Bible tells us this as we probe. It says, Philippians 2, 3, and 4, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty pride, but in humility consider others more important than who? Than yourself. Each of you should, here's the word, underline it, highlight it, cut it out, paste it on your forehead. Look. It says, each of you should look, not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. This word, look, in the Greek is photos, which is also the word for photograph or uh, to, to see or to look. And when it's talking about look, it's actually telling us to, to really focus on the other's interest above our own. Be very intentional about how it is that you're dealing with conflict, making sure that when you're looking towards something, here's, here, let me break it down like this. Look with the intent to understand. Look with the intentions to understand, because you got to know this, that hurt people hurt people. But praise God that the opposite is the same, that loving people love people. The last practical step is this, make peace, right? Make peace with each other. The, emphasize reconciliation, not resolution. Can, can I say that? Like making peace with other people, right? It's not, not meaning that we're, we're going to resolve the issue, but the goal is that I can have peace about the situation. Oftentimes it's this. See, here's, here's, here's one of the issues, and I'll share this, is that uh, have you ever heard of that, the, the, the way they catch monkeys in the Amazon? Right? The way they do this is they cut up these little coconuts, right? And, and they make these little grooves. They're like little claws, just small enough in order for the monkey to get his hand in there. And what they do is they put food inside of it. So the, they throw them out, right? And it's attached to a tree or to a string to make sure that once the monkey gets his hand in there, right, that here's what happens. The monkey is so hungry and wants that food so much that when he puts his hand in there, he grabs it. And he tries to pull his hand out with the food, but he can't pull it out because his hand's bundled up in a fist. Conflict is like this sometimes. Like we, we, we reach for something, we grab it, and we won't let it go. You see, because what happens to the monkey is this, is that since it can't let the food go and release itself, it doesn't realize that that is its demise. The very thing that it's holding on to is the very thing it's going to end his life. And some of you are holding on to conflict. And it's draining the life out of you. And God's like this, just let it go. It, it doesn't mean that things will be resolved. But it does mean that you are on a journey and on the road in the right direction to have, here's the word, peace. You're on the road to receive peace. Family, let's, let's in my journey to where the Lord, by his grace, has brought me today, I have, I have left a trail of broken relationships with my siblings, with my mom, with my dad, family members. It was, it was so bad to a point that I would go preach at a church and people would walk up to me and go, do you remember me? And they would say that with a tone that the first thing out of my mouth was, I'm sorry. Whoever that individual was back then is no longer that same man today. And I thank God by the, his grace that he has allowed me to reconcile all these relationships. And there's, there's a ton more that, that I'm still working on. But I thank by the grace of God that he has been allowing me to let go of some certain issues to not work on other people, but to work on myself. And as I share this last point with you, I, I want you to your prayer. The last point is to maintain your altitude to maintain your attitude. And what does that mean? Well, it's found in this text here that I'm going to read. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 to 21. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. 
Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God who was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against him, and he was committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Would you say amen? Would you say amen? Family, before I pray and close in prayer, if there is anything or any area in your life or in your relationship that you are trying to avoid and ignore conflict, when I pray, I'm going to invite you just, just before I finish in prayer, just to kind of pray to God about that name. Because right now, I, right now, I guarantee you, most of you are probably thinking that you can see that person's face right now. I'm going to pray that, that you, this word isn't just something that tickles your ears, but moves you to propose, to pray, to probe, and to practice what it is to deal with these conflicts. Let's pray.